of the cavernous sinus part of the ICA. Two cases of uh, giant ICA aneurysm uh, not amenable to clipping or coiling uh, were taken since 2016. Uh, patients underwent uh, surgical treatment in neurosurgery department of uh, Fujita Health University. During bypass surgery, interoperative methods uh, such as Doppler sonography, ICG, and uh, DIVA were used to determine the potency of the graft artery. This is a 77-year-old female with giant aneurysm uh, on the right cavernous part of the internal car carotid artery. Here we can see uh, aneurysm. DSA, uh, preoperative 3D and CTA, and DSA shows a giant aneurysm. Patient uh, was treated with radial artery graft technique and ICA, ICA occlusion. As an adjunct for high flow bypass, we also performed uh, ISA to uh, MCA bypass. This interoperative uh, pictures, uh, dissecting radial artery, radial artery. Uh, this is um, internal carotid artery. Um, occluded by double ligation. After occluding, um, ICG and DIVA demonstrate that there is, there is not blood flow into ICA after occlusion. Uh, Doppler sonography uh, radial artery and M, uh, MCA. So ICG and uh, DIVA illustration of blood uh, flow restoration after anastomosis. Here we can see. Uh, Post-operative uh, course was uh, uneventful. There were no mortality or morbidity. Follow-up uh, showed good, good recovery and post-operative CT showed complete occlusion uh, of ligated IC and patent uh, functioning arterial uh, graft. Uh, there is a uh, pre-op uh, CD CT, and this is post-operative. Here is a radial artery gra graft, and uh, we see uh, aneurysm uh, disappeared. The also, and uh, red radial artery. For uh, CCA with mass effect, high flow bypass with proximal occlusion of ICA uh, seems to be the first choice treatment for large and giant CCA because of the uh, high rate of aneurysm thrombosis. Interoperative Doppler sonography and DIVA makes to, uh, it easy to check uh, the potency of the graft. DIVA is superior over uh, Doppler or ICG in terms uh, of better visualization of related anatomical structures. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. Any questions, please? Yeah, uh, thank you, doctor. And uh, do you have the standard of the uh, have the always the, the high floor and the low floor bypass? You know, uh, I I, I want to ask uh, uh, how many volumes the uh, the blood floors one minute. Which one is the uh, high floor? Which one is the low floor? I mean, do you, do you have the standard? And how to uh, evaluate it? Actually, uh, what what is the difference between high flow and low flow? Yeah. Just now you said it's a high floor, high floor bypass. Yeah. Uh, radial arteric yeah. Uh, graft and low flow uh, CCA. Mm. Uh, high flow is if you use uh, secondary branches from the ECA, mm. the branches which arise from the ECA, you use an STA or the, uh, a part of the STA, frontalis or the temporalis branch, and that is a low flow bypass because it is having a low flow into that artery. Yeah. When you do, uh, actually what he has not mentioned is the radial artery was tunneled yeah, yeah, all the way to the neck and it was taken directly from the ECA, from, from the common carotid, ECA, the mm. next branch which comes out will be the radial artery bypass. 
okay the bypass so the eca whatever flow is there in the eca will be taken directly from the radial artery into the mca that makes it a high flow bypass yes, sir. Of the artery is yeah yeah the bigger the diameter of the radial artery is bigger that's why it uh, yeah. transmits more blood from the eca directly when we uh, use the Yeah, this 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 this, uh, this only I'm asked. Now. I I wanted to know uh, uh, how many volume, how how many milliliters for one minute mm. per per one minute. Do you know? Per floor. Oh yes, yeah, and which one is the high floor? Do you, no, do you, do you, do you have the yeah? I don't think anybody. Nobody has done a workup or research saying that. This much uh, may make it high flow, and this much may make it low flow. Uh, it, be know. it becomes on the uh, diameter of the artery, actually. When you have se secondary arteries like the STA, they are low, m smaller diameter arteries, mm -hmm. so they can pass very less amount of blood flow. But he, see, in a high flow, why we need a high flow bypass in this instance? Because we wa we are going to cut off the complete I ICA segment which is going all the way up to M2. So we want a part of this blood to also go back into the M1 a little bit. Not all the way up to the ophthalmic or uh, that segment, but we want a part of it going back also. Plus it should also supply the whole M2. So we th for that reason, we need a high flow bypass. When you are doing an entrapping uh, uh, of an uh, uh, artery, we need a high flow bypass. That is why directly from the ECA, a large artery mm. with a large diameter large, is yeah. taken to the MCA. <laughs> oh, yeah. So uh, you are you are asking the, the uh, standards diameters, yes? Uh. So I can answer like this. Uh, for example, uh, you uh, cut the IC, mm. yes? Uh, you are ligated, it. And the high flow bypass is when uh, this uh, graft will supply, will take all of the blood that was coming from IC and uh, directly to the brain. So it should get all of these, uh, for example, it was uh, pumping uh, 50 milliliters of uh, blood every uh, heartbeat. So it should go there uh, through this graft, all of them, not a small part, not percent, for example, not 5%, not 10%. Mm -hmm. uh, complete blood of the IC should go to the MC. That's why we choose uh, IC, uh, from external uh, to the MC, uh, M2 branch. Not M3, not M4. Uh, M3 and M4 will be used for low flow bypass because low flow bypass is only from STA and it's not uh, the complete uh, uh, amount of blood flow that is coming from the IC. Mm. That's why. It works in, technically it works like a flow diverter because uh, once you divert the intensity or the uh, volume of blood flow through the IC, the aneurysm also thrombosis. That is probably the principle by which this system works. That through the EC, it directly supplies the brain to the middle cerebral artery. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation. I now call upon Dr. Apurva Prasad to present his talk on Hiramaya, Hirayama disease and ex unexplained perspective. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my colleagues, my colleagues and the respected chairperson. I'm Dr. Apoorva Prasad from Mumbai, India. Uh, I think I'm the seventh person on the dais giving a talk from Mumbai, so I won't, uh, you know, waste any time highlighting my city and my country. Uh, this is the hospital where I'm currently undergoing my residency training in the third year of neurosurgery. Uh, the hospital is a, it has completed 40 successful years and uh, currently is accredited by the National Board for Residency Programs in various disciplines. This is our department. As of now, we are four residents in the department under the guided and honored leadership of our Professor P.S. Ramani. Many of you would 
probably know him as the stalwart of the modern neurospinal surgery, and he is also the father of Indian neurospinal surgery. And we, we, we find us fortunate enough to operate alongside with him in the operating rooms. And of course, Professor Atul Goel, uh, he needs no introduction. And I'm very thankful to him and to Professor Kato Ma'am for giving us res young residents the platform to meet and share knowledge amongst all others. So my talk today is on Hirayama disease. I don't think many of us have even heard the name of Hirayama disease. And uh, it's quite a rare entity. This, the entity was first described by Professor Hirayama in 1959. And the DV and the entity has been named after himself. And uh, it's quite rare to find. And uh, we believe that most probably it has been underreported and misdiagnosed. That is why we don't have many good case series or case reports from various parts of the country, though a high incidence is found in the Asian countries. So this is a typical example of a patient who presents in the outpatient department. The faction affected are young individuals from 15 to 30 years of age. And this is a typical presentation when the patient comes to you, you can see the flexion contractures in the fingers. You can see the bony deformity at the, on the ulnar tuberosity, on the ulnar, ulnar prominence. You can see the significant wasting and the hollowing of the small muscles of the forearm and the arm. So this is another patient who has the same, uh, uh, who has the same flexure contracture. And these patients present to us with crippling uh, and disabling weak, weak, uh, weakness in the arms. So much so that they aren't even able to hold an object or to write or to even hold anything, not even able to make a fist. So something definitely needs to be done for them. On investigation, or the, the, the CT scan reveals a hyperflexibility of the cervical spine with a kyphotic deformity. The MRI is very interesting in these patients because the characteristics are hallmark of the disease which have been classified and uh, have been documented in literature. Uh, if you can see on flexion of the neck, there is a pseudo mass on the lower uh, subaxial cervical spine, which is contrast enhancing. On detubated images, you can again see this contrast enhancing heter uh, or this uh, heterogeneous mass, which disappears completely on extension of the neck. So this dynamic variation on the MRI scan in flexion and extension is the hall hallmark of the disease. And uh, Dr. Goel was the first person to uh, establish the relationship, relationship between a C1, C2 and a subaxial spine facetal instability and the spinal alterations which occur in Hirayama disease. So as you can see, there is a posterior dislocation of C1 facet over C2, and this formed the basis of our treatment in which the patients had undergone an extensive spinal stabilization without any bony decompression or without any dural maneuvering, which has been described in the past, and the patients only underwent a extensive spinal stabilization. And as you can see, this is a post-op MRI. This is inflection, and you can see there is no soft tissue component which was present earlier. This is another patient, the second patient, in whom you can again see the hyperflexibility of the spine, the kyphotic deformity. Now this patient had an exterior soft heterogeneous mass at both the upper cervical and the lower subaxial cervical spine on the, on the flexion. And again on extension, there was complete absence of this mass. You can see the heterogeneous mass on T2 weighted scans. And this is the type of instability which we are talking about, the C1, C2 instability, which has never been given importance and has not been documented in literature. So again, this patient underwent a C1, C2 to C7 transarticular facetal fixation. And this is a post-operative MRI scan on uh, inflection, which shows the resolution of the lower, complete resolution of the lower subaxial soft tissue mass and mild persistence of the upper cervical mass. So Dr. <laughs> Balaganpati sir, this is one of the case series of Goel sir in which we have a very short number of patients, five patients, which is contrary to what Goel sir publishes. This is because of the rarity of the disease and as I have highlighted because of the uh, underdiagnosis of this disease. So there were five patients over a period of 19 months who were treated for this uh, progressive weakness in both the hands. And all the patients were treated and all the patients had flexion deformities and a weak hand grip on presentation. The power of the hands was assessed by the Japanese Orthopedic Association score. And uh, the MRI features I've already highlighted on the imaging. And all the patients were un underwent an extensive trans-articular facetal stabilization, including the C1, C2 joint in four patients, except for one who was the first patient to be operated. And no or, uh, dural or bony decompression was performed. And uh, an uh, the patient was operated with an intraoperative traction, which helped us to maintain the cervical spine in a normal alignment during the surgery. So you can see that in the series of five patients, uh, all the patients, the, our mean age group was 20.3 years. You can see the age range of 16 years to 21 years. And uh, the, there was improvement in the post-operative GOA score, as you can see from in all the patients. 
And uh, this is the stabilization which was done, including the C1, C2 joints in these four patients, except for the first patient in whom only a transarticular subaxial cervical spine fixation was done. So the results have been quite encouraging. The patients on the evening of surgery were relieved of the weakness and the spasticity which they had. The contractures over a period of 17.6 months follow-up have disappeared. And in two patients, we were able to see complete disappearance of the soft tissue exterior mass, as has been highlighted. So the Sirayama disease, it's a self-limited, asymmetrical, but a chronically progressive disabling deformity affecting the younger population. And it's very interesting to see that the clinical and the radi radiological parameters for this disease have been quite uh, distinctively classified in literature, but the causative uh, reason for the occurrence of the disease has not been, uh, is quite debatable. And there are many theories as to why this disease, uh, why the spinal alterations occur. And because of this varied etiology proposed by many people, the treatment options vary from a single level discectomy to a corpectomy to laminectomies, laminoplasties, even to dural hitching, dural stenting. All the treatment procedures have been uh, used off in the past, but n never before in the literature has any importance been given to the presence of instability at the atlantoaxial and the subaxial cervical spine. And uh, we were the first uh, to give importance to this etiology and to treat patients based on the instability and only inst uh, instability was treated without any bony or a dural maneuvering. And the patients have improved and these results have encouraged us to continue this management in the patients. And uh, to conclude, I would like to propose the same thing that multi-segmental spinal instability most probably including the C1, C2 joint, points a nodal point of pathogenesis in the chronic alteration in Hinayama disease. And maybe this needs to be further followed up and uh, looked into, but very soon, sir, you can expect a larger case series with more patients in the coming years. Thank you. These are my references. Thank you. <coughs> and namaste, as we say in India. Yeah. That is an excellent presentation and a uh, very little discussed topic because it's new to India. Anybody has any questions? Thank you, sir. My, my question is, um, because I don't know, mm -hmm. why you prefer posterior um, instrumentation than anterior? Because of the facetal instability. We need to stabilize the facets. The okay. primary etiology of this disease is the facetal instability. We okay. need to stabilize the facets, we need to go posteriorly. Okay. And, you and, in, and in literature, there have been uh, case series, if you go into literature, when people have performed corpectomies also. And uh, the results have not been so encouraging, but we need a limited bony maneuvering, and we follow a philosophy and a principle of minimal bony decompression, and just stabilization of the facet joints posteriorly is more than enough to treat these patients. My concerning is about uh, those patients uh, are too young. Yeah, yeah. So this is a disease which affects the young population yeah, and only. And uh, the main load is on the anterior, anterior, anterior column. Anterior so anterior if we stabilize column. the posterior column, it's rigid, and the weight load shifts it's from so anterior to posterior. Bad. Definitely, this is a concern. That is why these patients are being followed up. But the, rather than removing an entire corpectomy and a uh, lamina, the entire body anteriorly, a minimal step, we use, if you can see, we don't put rods. We only put transarticular screws. Yes, 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 we yes, don't yes, put yes. rods. Yes. So it's still not a completely rigid fixation, which allows okay. for move. We just are fixing to fix the, 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 yeah, the, just to the fix the, the facet joints. joints. Distraction, yes. reduction, and fixation is the principle which we follow. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so uh, just one. So, what you are saying is posteriorly you are not doing a lot of things and you are trying to so that to preserve the motion analysis and not yeah. to so that you can do even anteriorly. No, just put a plate, anterior plate, that, that will stabilize the this rather thing. than doing a corpectomy, putting a plate. No, no, no. Don't do a corpectomy. Yeah, is see it what is, is in Hirayama? Yeah. There is nothing that is pushing anteriorly behind onto the thing. It is because of during the movements. The dural stretch yeah. onto the b bodies causing this primary pathology, isn't it? That is the whole pathogenesis behind it. So why don't we put just a plate anteriorly without doing any corpectomy? You mm -hmm. just put a plate anteriorly so that there is no hyperextension of the neck or maybe th there is no hyperflexion of the neck. The and you preserve the motion in that part that much. And you still get your thing. I mean, what is yeah. preventing you from doing that? See, the hyperflexibility of the neck all is secondary to the instability of the facet joints. So rather than treating the hyperflexibility, which is visible on the scans, treating the primary pathology, which is the instability of the facets, if we stabilize the facets posteriorly, automatically these secondary alterations are taken care of because the primary pathology which we have prophesized and which we are following is the instability of the facet joints, which cannot be done anteriorly. 
So if we stabilize the joints posteriorly, we don't need any anterior uh, maneuvering of the bones to uh, stabilize the spine in any way. Once the joint, facet joints are fixed and fused, the hyperflexibility automatically is taken care of. Know is how did you get to know that that was the change only at the facet joints? I mean, did you do any other thing? I mean, are you looking at grade one listhesis in on an X-ray or are you looking at on an MRI? Is there a dynamic MRI that you are looking at? Yeah, we, I showed the dynamic MRI. Sorry, the, sorry, I, yeah. was, I did, I did yeah. see it. So, so this the classic the yeah, distinction of the disease is based on a dynamic MRI. When in a flexion can you see a soft tissue component, but while in the extension it's completely normal. And this points towards the instability. That is, the whole treatment is based on the dynamic scans, MRI and the CT. Yeah, in five, four out of five patients, we have stabilized the C1, C2 joints because it was visible. Posterior. See, uh, in five, four out of five patients, only C1, C2 joint has been fixed. In the first patient, there was no interoperative evidence of C1, C2 instability, so a sub fixation was done. So this is a finding on CT scans and interoperatively, and we are going ahead with the treatment, and the patients are improving, so this supports our hypothesis that this, this might be the causative factor. So that's the. Uh, thank you. It was really a good presentation, and a new uh, as well for me. Uh, I was asking what Parsad asked about. Yeah. It is a multi-level, uh, multi-segmental uh, multi fixation and stabilization is there. Yes, you mentioned about the dynamic, what we are doing X-ray normally is the MRI as well, you mentioned before. But again, uh, is there any special criteria or condition that we can 100% uh, sure that if we go for this, this, this level segment uh, fixation and stabilization, the result will be Good. Yeah, the level, the levels of fixation, in, uh, so the level of fixation is decided by the extension of the soft tissue component, which you see on the dynamic MRI flexion MRI. scan. Yeah. So the extent to which the soft tissue component is extending, those levels must be fixed. And usually in these patients, a lower cervical spine is most commonly affected from C3 to C7. So in our series, all the patients have gone fixation from C3 to C7. Two of them have, uh, and only uh, and four of them have included C1, C2 also. So the level of fixation depends on the instability of the facet joints interoperatively and the MRI picture of the soft tissue component extension. And you mentioned about the five patient, it was study on five patient. Yeah. So the follow-up for how the you- average follow-up has been 20, uh, 20 months. 20 months, yeah. so how is the result till now? The result is quite encouraging. In two of the patients, the soft tissue component which was visible on flexion of the neck has completely disappeared. Mm -hmm. And all the patients have improved in the contractures and the, weak, and the grip. So this result in, is encouraging our hypothesis that a stabilization of the joint is a definite treatment for these patients rather than an extensive corpectomy or a dural stenting or a decompression procedure. The results are very encouraging and we are following up with them. And this was a study with five patients. Now we have in the last two years operated many patients more and we will be publishing our results very soon. And the okay. results have been very, very encouraging. Okay. So along with the fixation, that mass fixation, you are putting screw yes. over there. Again, after three in four months, uh, later on it's not working. If you reopen the patient, the screw everywhere, you will see you lose uh, screws everywhere. So how you can say it, if you're not doing anything anteriorly, grafting and such thing, so how you can say it will work? Because we are, interoperatively, we use a cervical traction, interoperatively, there's a cervical traction, we stabilize the joints in normal anatomical position, and then we fix the joint with transarticular facetal screws. So the screws are fixed in the normal neutral alignment, then it means it will fuse. Yeah, Normally. the main purpose is to make the joints fuse. Uh, anyways, after any instrumentation, three months post fusion, the instruments are not needed. The, screw, the work of the screws is still the fusion occurs. Once the fusion occurs, you don't need your implants. Even if the implants fall off, you don't, you're not worried about them. Right, yeah. So a period of more than two and a half to three months is definite enough for fusion to occur. And once that is there, you don't need your screws, even if they become loose and they fall off. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you Thank for you. the presentation. Uh, Dr. Virya Dharma, please. For the next presentation, can we have the lights off, please? Dr. Prasad, can we have the lights off, please? Thank you. I will bring the case of branded recovery. Uh, it is a simple uh, case, but and a little bit outside the box, but. 
uh, I decided to bring up the case because this case was shocking me as a doctor. And please, if you have the uh, same experience, please uh, share with me here. So. Uh, question for you. Uh, are you familiar with uh, declaring branded in your institution? If you familiar, maybe you will find this uh, picture oftenly. Uh, so, I must say that declaring a brand debt is very important and difficult thing because it is determined the next act to the patient whether it's not uh, uh, continue the treatment or uh, decide the surgery or maybe decide for transplantation. But also, this is a big loss for the family. So the question is, are branded guidelines still adequate for now? And uh, are guidelines still applicable in global perspective? Global perspective. I mean this uh, with the diverse uh, countries and the diverse uh, facility and uh, utility. Is it still applicable for, for us with the same guidelines? I have a case report, 19 years old male presented at uh, the emergency department with a traffic incident. Uh, came with unconsciousness and unresponsive. After three days, uh, referring from the other hospital, uh, he was intubated with GCS3 with uh, both pupil fix and maximal dilated, and also with uh, absence of other brainstem reflexes. And uh, we uh, ordered the head CT. This is the head CT. We showed that uh, there's a subdural and contusion, and also uh, with a brain, uh, white brain edema. So after three days and admission day in my hospital, this is the control of CT scan, the brain uh, edema wider than uh, before. So uh, the patient referred to the ICU, and uh, we also determined brain death uh, with uh, qualification like this and uh, positive uh, with my colleagues uh, positive uh, brain death after two times we the exa do examination uh, with the same result. But uh, lucky me, uh, the family decide to not uh, stop the uh, support. So he remains in the ICU. And in day 10, it was shocking for me because uh, there's a minimal light reflex and gag reflex, and, uh, but still in GCS3. And day 14, GCS uh, improved with light reflex uh, adequate in both pupils and uh, present uh, uh, signs of uh, intracranial pressure. Uh, increase. So uh, we do the CT scan control, and this is the CT. We have a uh, uh, communicating hydrocephalus, and uh, we decide to do the fee patient. This is after the post op. And the follow up patient was sent home after eight weeks with uh, improving so much uh, GCS with adequate spontaneous breathing. So uh, my discussion is. This is a uh, history of a uh, death. Actually, the breathing, firstly, breathing ceased, and after the stethoscope found, loss of the heartbeat is uh, defining as death, and with the ventilator, and uh, now uh, no cerebral function uh, remains as, uh, as a death. So, uh, this is the, just a history of the brain death criteria. Uh, this is, we already know uh, how the branded criteria is. But uh, this is uh, actually the case of a uh, date. Uh, they uh, use a uh, recovery uh, for the uh, case. But mostly, only one journal that I found from the medical aspect. So this is the discussion. A forum that uh, last only in tw uh, 2012 in Montreal about the guidelines. So this is some uh, this uh, question that we already we usually uh, ask uh, about the branded. 
actually. And in conclusion, I think determining and branded is very difficult because uh, complexity aspect, including medical, social, ethical, and also legally aspect. And uh, we need the more aerodynamic reports from medical aspect. So uh, the update forum regarding this topic will be uh, soon uh, be held. This is my conclusion. Right now, this is Indonesia, you actually know. I, I work and live right now this, in this uh, small island. Uh, about three neurosurgeons in Indonesia for about 250 million people and uh, 20 of them uh, a female a neurosurgeon. This is my island. You, you welcome uh, to my place. Also, this is the uh, beautiful face of my place. This is, uh, I want to show this is the ugly face too from my place because of uh, thin mining, uh, legally and illegally uh, in my place, but uh, you can still enjoy the, the ugly face too. <laughs> this is my uh, hospital uh, in Bangka. Actually, I'm the only one neurosurgeon in my hospital and the, in the island only two neurosurgeons for about 1.3 million people. Terima kasih. Arigato gozaimasu. Uh, Dr. Peter Dharma, I have a question for you. Was an MRI done for this patient? The MRI done, uh, not yet done. Not yet done. And uh, was the patient apneic on admission to your hospital or when the patient was taken to the first hospital, was the patient apneic? Was there respiration at that time? Uh, the patient came to me after three days. And at that time, was there spontaneous respiration or not? No, no spontaneous okay. uh, breathing. Okay. So, any comments from the audience? I think in India we see it, please. So, I think this is a very controversial topic because if you really put this paper out, then all the transplants that have been taken place in the world are just going to go back. The live <laughs> donor transplant. So, uh, we better be careful where, when we are doing this. Second, I want to know uh, what is your protocol in your hospital? Like you said, there is a 1.5 million and there are only two neurosurgeons. Yeah. So, what is the protocol that you all follow while declaring brain death? See, I, I think I, you have, may have read the guidelines and all that, but are you following the right protocol? For example, in India, what we follow is there are two neurosurgeons and one neurointensivist. They do uh, themselves their own uh, this thing at say, uh, one hour, after that at, at 12 hours and then 24 hours and then we declare it to be brain dead. So all these three people do their own evaluation separately. They don't come together, sit and see that apnea has gone or not. So all this is done separately plus we have to have other, all other parameters that have to be normal during that time. The sodium value, the potassium value. There are a lot of things that have, so have all these been completely looked at before you have come out with this? Okay, uh, a very good uh, question. Yes, Okay. because yeah, you have only yeah. two neurosurgeons in 1.5 and according to that, that does not fit into the guidelines actually to declare the brain that you need at least another neurologist or somebody else you need you know or yeah IQ okay. so I think your uh, organ transplant program the cadaveric yeah. organ transplant program Thank is not in the place <laughs> such a uh, good uh, experience and share with me so for the guideline actually uh, we uh, usually from the way how the last is uh, only uh, we don't need any three doctors actually and it doesn't need to be neuro. It, uh, it, can, uh, it should be uh, another specialty, in, uh, according to how actually. Uh, for transplantation itself, uh, it should be two doctors. And one of the doctor should be the doctor who do the transplantation. And he should uh, see uh, exactly 
the patient is. This is according to WHO. Then uh, I think uh, the guidelines uh, enough for me to declare. Uh, it is not only me, actually. Uh, we have a uh, narrow intensive care uh, specialty, and uh, we do the not only once, but I told you uh, seconds. Uh, and also during the care in ICU, we also do every uh, every day to do the brainstem reflexes. Brainstem reflexes can be absent because of the cranial nerve deficits. Yeah. All the brainstem reflexes yeah. can get absent mm -hmm. if you have all these cranial nerve deficits. Okay. So this, there, that is not the only criteria. What I'm uh, telling you, I mean, I'm trying to point you is, there might be some, see, if there is no neurosurgeon or a neurologist who evaluates that, there may be a bias in evaluating yeah. it at first. That, yeah. that bias you have not cleared yeah. by asking somebody, if, you, if I ask some of my surgical friends to come and uh, evaluate a neuro patient, I don't think they will be that qualified to really tell me that whether the brainstem activity. And uh, second thing, in all your scans, I'm not seeing the white uh, reflex. Usually on a CT, you see an inversion. The brainstem becomes more uh, this than the, that is not seen in any of the scans. Yeah, actually, I'm yes. sorry, because I want to yes. uh, get the big picture of the CT. Yeah, so in that, mm. that is when we actually think about brainstem. Yeah. So even on your scans, uh, even looking at your scans, I would not say that this person is brain dead even looking just at the CT, because there is not, that inversion has not happened. The cerebral white sign that yeah. they say, it has not happened in any of your scans. So I would, <laughs> in this patient, I would think that maybe there was a miss of evaluation. Yeah. I, I think so. I'm not uh, judging or I'm not, maybe there is a chance that, because to, uh, you know, challenge some uh, this thing and it has been followed all if such papers do come up then all the transplant all over the world will stop because every person will say will refer to this patient saying that he has survived this thing and come back so before we put any of these papers I think it is our responsibility before we put all this I think all of this should be taken care of and should be attempted to at least you know everything is proper and then only we put this forward because a lot of people are being saved because of these transplants will stop suddenly because of all of this. Uh, on that the is my only concern. On the other hand, I think a single report would make it an anecdotal issue and would not be used as a standard reference. Yeah. So till more events like... That will cause everybody to refer to that. Probably report. they need to go back through their books and see what is going wrong <laughs> where. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thank you. Okay, sure. So, uh, for the, you say the caloric test and some others, it is actually, I uh, put it on my slide, but uh, your question about the EEG, yeah. According to the guidelines, uh, it, it should uh, include in ancillary tests. Ancillary tests in the guideline is not necessary to do, it is not a uh, replace criteria, replacing criteria, but only additional criteria. So if uh, the, we can do the apnea test accurately, then we m maybe additional uh, uh, examination is ancillary test. But I think for me, uh, if I cannot do apnea test, maybe I shouldn't declare it, it is brain dead. You understand? Even as far as the apnea test is concerned, you do it once or you repeat it? Repeat it. After how many hours? After 12 hours. 12 hours. Yeah. Okay. And both are negative, then that is conclusive. You don't yes. need any other test to be done. Yes. Okay. Because in India, we have a very complex pattern. So I just wanted to know what are your parameters? So, you know, if you ask me, basically, I would say that, you know, if you have some more tests, 
to confirm your findings, like a flatline EEG, an absent evoked potential. These will, you know, save everyone from controversy as to, you know, the more the test to confirm your diagnosis, to declare a patient actually brain dead, the safer you are and the more confirmed your findings are. Yeah. I just, that's just a suggestion to you. Maybe. Uh, so we at our hospital are practicing EEGs, evoked potentials, and yeah. Evoked potentials also not on. We don't do it. No caloric test. Caloric test is done. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, these brain versions, yeah. The and uh, certification by three or four, I mean, three, which I said, mm -hmm. all this follows that we don't need a secondary, like the confirmatory, what you're saying, uh, uh, coronary and angiogram. Yeah. yeah. Just for, but doing apnea test, we have to see that all the other parameters are, are normal. normal. Yeah, exactly. That's what. We have to bring it to normal. There should not, shouldn't be a hypothermia, hypotension, bradycardia, or whatever. It should be to be normal, and then we'll do Exactly. <laughs> I said that is why we are practicing the uh, supportive criteria also to justify because you know there are always controversies with fewer tests. So that is why to be on the safer side, we are applying more tests just as a confirmatory criteria as to if even if one is controversial, the others justify a diagnosis because so then the guidelines it, is not yeah. compulsory. That's what it's not compulsory. But okay. one more thing, as a new told, as in respiratory center would have been affected <laughs> and apnea test is positive. So that means the patient won't be breathing further. Yeah, that's why, yeah, that's why she's... No, no, she's as in, that's, that means the patient is brain dead, I guess. That is a brain stem death, no. point time. <laughs> But <laughs> usually it doesn't happen as in localized. Yeah, exactly. If a brain uh, stem death, yeah. Anyway, stroke, thank you. Thank you very much for such a big discussion. That was an excellent presentation. Dr. Ria's presentation is apparently not opening. She has got too many viruses in her presentation. So I call upon Dr. Aminul Haq, please. Thank you, Chairman. Good evening, everyone. I would like to invite you all to my presentation. The titles of my presentation is Neutrophil Extracellular Traps in Intensive Care, Friends of Voice. First of all, I would like to thanks to Professor Yoko Kato Sensei. Because of her, I am getting this chance to introduce my research work in front of you, and I am getting the chance to meet all the neurosurgeons from all over the world. Thank you very much to Kato Sensei. For a moment, please. Uh, Dr. Hok Muhammad Aminul is a uh, doctor and many years workers in Nagoya. He is, has a PhD and very good specialist on this area. Uh, Yo Do Professor Yoko Kato specifically invited him to teach us. Thank you. Thank you, Taimur. 
Actually, uh, I am going to talk, everything is very basic, so you may not be interested, but uh, uh, thank you for giving me the chance. So, I, I was graduated from Bangladesh. My college name was Sheri Bangla Medical College under the Dhaka University School of Medicine. And then in 2014, I got my PhD from IT Medical University from the Department of Emergency and Critical Care Medicine. After that, for one and a half year, I worked in intensive care unit as a researcher in the Fujita Health University. And then from 2015, I am working as a researcher uh, in the IT Medical University again. This is the hospital, main hospital building of IT Medical University. And uh, this is the research building. And uh, here I took some foreign fellows of currently working in IT Medical University. Uh, and uh, this is the research facilities. Now I am working there. So, all of us know that uh, neutrophils are the first line soldiers to battle against microorganism. It is the most important in arm of innate immunity. Uh, the, when we see the neutrophils, we find that it has, its nucleus is multi-lobed and there, there are a lot of granules inside the cytoplasm of neutrophil. This Granules contains proteins. These proteins are cytotoxic, uh, the, uh, such as myeloperoxidase, neutrophil elastase, cathepsin G, MM9, etc. The main function of neutrophil is to kill the microorganism. It kills microorganism by phagocytosis, exocytosis, and netosis. In the process of phagocytosis, neutrophils goes to the pathogen and just engulf it and digest it. In the exocytosis, neutrophil goes to the cyto pathogens and just extrude some cytotoxic materials from its granules. And netosis, I am going to describe it later. Netosis, uh, this process of microbial killing by neutrophils was uh, discovered very recently in 2004. Uh, in this process, neutrophil release a net-like structure around it. It contains DNA and DNA with histones and these web-like structures are started with the granular protein, such as myeloperoxidase, neutrophil elastase, and others. So these neutrophils release the nets by stimulation. Ex vivo, PMA is a strong stimulant. And uh, actually, in our body, uh, we know uh, when pathogen enters in our body, uh, it releases some molecules like pathogen associated molecular patterns, and these patterns are uh, recognized by our innate immune cells. Uh, that is the name of this, that molecules are uh, receptors are uh, patho uh, patterns recognition receptors, as well as damage associated molecular patterns. Uh, these are also re pattern recognition receptors. When the immune cells, neutrophils, uh, got signals from the PAMs and DAMs, it releases nets. And uh, as it contains histones and other cytotoxic agents, nets are very cytotoxic for our health. The main action of nets is killing microorganism. So it kills microorganism. Previously, it, it could not be understood that, understood that how neutrophil kills 
fungus. Fungus is larger than neutrophil. But after when we get, uh, when it was discovered that, it, that we have, it is, we can understood that uh, neutrophil, when release nets, it can en entrap larger diameter of hyphae and uh, uh, does de then it can kill the uh, uh, fungus and there are lot of gram negative organisms also there are gram positive organisms and uh, microbial tuberculosis viruses and parasitosis uh, this can be killed by uh, netosis and this uh, this figure was taken from our uh, completed manuscript it is not being published yet and uh, one important feature of nets is it can be uh, formed under flowing blood, flowing condition. In the phagocytosis, it cannot be, uh, it cannot happen in the flowing condition. So it is one important feature of nets. And uh, when we have seen that uh, in knockdown, knockout mice, we use uh, the exacerbation of infections were, uh, happened. And immunothrombosis, e, the, this term is being used very recently. Thrombus is not only for hemostasis. For the long, uh, for the decades ago, uh, it was said that uh, thrombosis has a function on uh, innate immunity, but it cannot uh, be explained. So um, we know nets have histones. Histones are negatively charged. So in, in, in the intrinsic factor, uh, intrinsic coagulation, the uh, factor 12 is activated by uh, negatively charged. So when uh, factor 12 comes to contact with the uh, uh, nets, it uh, makes a larger surface for uh, activation of coagulation. And in the, uh, and these thrombus contain the microorganisms uh, thus uh, neutrophil is uh, now uh, contributing for innate immunity and uh, thrombo uh, thrombus generations. And uh, the contents of peptidyl arginine D aminase, cathepsin G or PMN, stimul uh, PMN elastase, all these things are uh, as a pa participating in innate immunity as well as they are participating in uh, thrombus formations. And uh, uh, paired four deficient mice are incapable of forming nets and thrombus. It has already been described. Uh, and uh, sepsis and DIC. What is the effect of netosis in sepsis? Sepsis is characterized by uncontrolled inflammation. There are upsurge of cytokines. Lot of cytokines, uh, cytokines uh, uh, are involved in uh, sepsis. And uh, in the, when a sepsis occurs in the body, neutrophils becomes stimulated. So in the stimulated neutrophils, it releases nets. It releases nets and the uh, cytotoxic, cytotoxic uh, agents of nets are causes injury to the underlying endothelial and epithelial layers. This causes activation of tissue factors of uh, coagulation and it causes more thrombus formation, more uh, uh, multiple organ failure and the situation becomes more deleterious. The, this situation is called uh, DIC. So the detrimental effect of netosis is sepsis, DIC and uh, multi-organ failure. And uh, there are other 
that was that is uh, like a, in case of uh, lung failure, uh, excessive uh, activation of neutrophils. We know that excessive activation of neutrophils causes multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. And for the multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, lung is the main target organ. So there are many methods, but uh, one method is that uh, extracellular histones, which comes from the nerves, are the main actors for ARDS. And uh, uh, Peter A. Ward has described that when LPS in works with uh, complement five, and they uh, comes to uh, they causes alveolar edema, neutrophil activations and macrophage, macrophage activation, and it it releases nerves. These nerves uh, release histones, and these histones causes severe lung edema and. Uh, um, uh, lung failure and uh, other vital systems like uh, in acute kidney injury uh, when uh, it has also found that uh, neutrophils when neutrophils recruited to the uh, tubules it causes further necrosis and these necrosed cells causes release of dams these dams causes release of nerves and uh, the situation becomes more uh, deteriorating and in case of acute liver injury it is also uh, working um, as a detrimental effect of because of nerves because uh, uh, liver sinusoids are the second place where the nerves are found abundantly during sepsis and uh, in case of sterile injury, like uh, uh, surgery or trauma, burn, uh, there is a ga great chance for uh, inflammatory second hit. So in these cases, um, it releases more nerves, and these nerves uh, det further deteriorate the situations if it is uncontrolled. And uh, uh, we measure circulating free DNA. Circulating free DNA is a biomarker for uh, nerves, uh, and it had been shown that in case of burn or trauma, the circulating free DNA uh, can uh, show the uh, prognosis, prognostic state of the uh, patient. So, net detection is important uh, as it has both um, positive and negative effect. And uh, so there are a lot of uh, few methods. Uh, so far, it is being used to detect the nets. One method is uh, measuring circulating free DNA uh, from plasma. And uh, this method is very easy, but it cannot differentiate it uh, whether this DNA we measure uh, from plasma is apoptotic origin or necrosis, necrosis origin or netotic origin. And, uh, uh, another method is sandwich, sandwich ELISA method. Uh, in our lab, we developed this method and uh, we have a publication about this. In this method, uh, we measure uh, DNA conjugated myeloperoxidase and DNA conjugated neutrophil elastase. But uh, uh, so it can recognize that uh, the net, the DNA, which is only uh, come from DNA uh, net, we can measure it. Uh, but uh, the problem is this process is very time consuming. It takes three days. Uh, uh, it is more reliable than uh, CFDNA nets, but it, uh, this process takes uh, three days. Another method is uh, uh, we can use immunofluorescence staining, but all the hospitals or all the institute have not uh, these facilities and uh, uh, it cannot uh, it it needs more expertization and it cannot be available very much. So uh, and uh, new nets can be used as uh, it it is uh, telling that uh, nets are double bladed sword. It has both actions. So removal of nets 
from the plasma is important and uh, uh, to uh, either inhibition or removal of nets. So there are many methods. We can use DNS or we can use histone antibody or something uh, to inhibit the netosis. But uh, it is uh, polymyxin B perfusion is being used the treatment for septic shock. So it can be used as a removal of nets from plasma. In our laboratory, we have uh, we have a uh, small uh, peristaltic uh, peristal uh, device, and uh, we use small polymyxin uh, module and connect it with uh, where we made an uh, is closed circuit, and then we introduce. PMA induced blood in the module and after uh, that we have measured uh, zero hour, one hour, two hour and four hour uh, basis of uh, myeloperoxidase DNA, neutrophil elastase DNA and CF DNA to see the how uh, uh, this hemoperfusion of polymyxin B can work uh, on uh, netosis. So we have seen that after two hours of two hours of perfusion of blood in through the polymyxin B filter, uh, the myeloperoxidase DNA and neutrophil elastase DNA were significantly de decreased from zero hour uh, blood and. Uh, so does happens in, uh, in case of CFDN in it. After two hours, it was significantly different from the uh, zero hour blood. But after, uh, after two hours, it, it little bit increased. Here is, uh, so it may be as it is the closed circuit. So and this closed circuit also activates the neutrophils. So at, uh, after activation, it releases again the netosis. So uh, from this uh, experiment, we can uh, say that nets can be removed from the uh, polymyxin B module, but uh, of course the time, uh, time should be limited. Over polymyxin B transfusion may not be good for uh, patients always. Nets as nets benefit the host in early phase of the infections and become detrimental in later stage. The fine tuning of net formation throughout the course of disease would be the goal for the development of uh, new net targeted therapies. Early detection of nets is essential to start the therapy and perhaps a combined therapeutic approach. Inhibition of stimulation when they become detrimental and uh, repair the tissue damage would be the best option for the treatment. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Hark uh, has been uh, in Japan uh, how many years? More than nine years. More than nine years. He's from Bangladesh. Okay. And maybe, I don't know, he will be going back to his own country or not. But he <laughs> is assisting of the the professor of the acute medicine. Uh, 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 you, you are Chief Takeyama Sensei. Yes, sensei. Is, uh, what, what is his uh, research work? Uh, so we are doing research, currently we are doing research inflammatory disease and sepsis. Uh, sepsis. Yes. Very famous uh, uh, professor of the se sepsis uh, research. So he is assisting his work for many years. He can speak Japanese very fluently. <laughs> Question? This is a very basic research work, yes. So one way, uh, of course, the clinical observation, the observation, but uh, uh, his, uh, such his uh, situation is another good option. But you must go back to your country, yes, I think. Yes. You must co contribute to your country. <laughs> yes. okay. Who is Bangladesh? You, Hi, please. Uh, 
I was uh, for, uh, almost end of the presentation. I came <laughs> from the war. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for your uh, come to say something for us and for the presentation. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Anybody, any questions? Uh, I find this a very exciting discovery because uh, ICU infections are a very common cause of morbidity and death in patients. And uh, I think neurosurgery patients who have d head injuries or post-operative face this problem often. And I am sure that your research will make a change in the way we treat our ICU patients and the bad infections they have. We wish you all the best in your research. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think we've had a great four days of winter seminar. I would thank all of you all for coming here. And the final thanking ceremony and what uh, is still <laughs> left. But I personally want to thank all of you to making this a very great uh, uh, seminar of sorts. Because I see people from all uh, over different countries, but all of you all sticking together understanding each other's problems. I think this is the forum that is needed right now for all the young neurosurgeons. So I'm very thankful to Professor Kato for bringing up such a thing for everyone. And I wish that all of you all can come again and again for the same. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we will have the final uh, closing uh, thanks from Professor Carto herself who and and <laughs> after that we will be having the certificate presentation at the venue at the hospital and uh, we would also like to give you a small memento uh, along with it uh, along with the certificate uh, a small practice those things that you saw last time uh, during the hands-on workshop each uh, each one will be given a card and we are also may, uh, working on the pen drives and all the uh, videos, edited videos will be on those pen drives for you except for today's. So uh, we're really sorry we could not edit today's videos. It's a very short time to edit. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And I want Professor Kato to give. Them. Thank you very much for uh, coming this time. So we'll have a, a small, a nice uh, gathering time. Uh, this is uh, maybe not, uh, not a last, but maybe we can see uh, many times in the future. So sure, we, we be sure to come back again, again. So even though Africa, Africa is I, I think not so far. How do you think? Far? <laughs> Just one stop in the Middle East, and uh, one more flight. Yes. So uh, thank you very much for you. Uh, and uh, we, uh, what time do we start? Seven thirty. Around seven thirty. Okay. Uh, the Japan, not Japanese time. Maybe Indonesian time. <laughs> Around seven thirty. Okay. So see you there. You you uh, seems very exhausted, so maybe <laughs> refreshment another one hour. Okay, see you soon. Thank you very much.
So it, the venue is at the ANA Crown Plaza. Uh, it is near Kanayama, which we went last time for the welcome party before that, a long way before that. Yes, 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 yes. The Crown Plaza ANA, I think it's a big building and I think everybody, if uh, it's on the second floor, so if uh, you all want to go ahead there without anyone, but we will be leaving here uh, by 7, 7.15. If you want to join us while going, everybody is going to go by walk only, so. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I, I forgot, one, 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 one thing I forgot, because uh, those people from Fujita, the headquarters, uh, they worked the last uh, maybe two weeks. Very work hard, so big, big applause. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Sorry, Japanese. <laughs> あの、ね、このような会、あの、支える仕事をさせてもらってすごい、あの、僕たちも勉強になりました。